What's up, everyone? This is Mark D'Amico. I just want to say thank you for giving us a listen or a watch. And please do not forget to rate, subscribe, or review us. We appreciate you giving us a listen. And here's the next episode of View from the Rafters, behind the scenes with the Boston Celtics, presented by Flexcar. All right, there are not many people in the world who get the opportunity to say that they were the first to do something ever. And this guy right here, Namias Keita, is able to do that. He's the first Portuguese player ever drafted in the NBA. He's the first Portuguese player to ever play in the NBA. Man, first and foremost, first and foremost what does that mean to you to be able to be the, the first from your home country to be playing in this league? Um, thanks for having me first. Um, but it means a lot to me just because of the responsibility it comes with. Um, I'm representing a lot of people back home and a lot of friends, family, whatever it may be, people that look up to basketball. So um, it's pretty it's pretty good to me that I can be pretty I, I can be the one that, rep, that represents them. And I feel like I'm I'm just trying to I'm just trying to do my best so I can make them proud, you know. So how did it start? Like, yeah, obviously you're coming from a country that clearly doesn't have a huge history of basketball. So, like, where did this start for you of wanting to play this game and learning that you could use what, what you were blessed with in terms of being seven feet tall uh, to be able to get here eventually? Yeah, it started when I was around 10. Uh, my older sister got, got pretty much uh, sent to play basketball by one of the teachers in, in the school. And one day I just went with her, and there was a boys' team next to them. And ever since then... Uh, they wanted me to get in there and just Smart get people. in the mix, you know. So ever since then, I was pretty tall too. So it <laughs> may, it may, it helped us. How tall well. were you then? At ten, uh, probably just a a palm higher than everybody else already. Yeah. You feel me? So I could, I could, I could stand out a little bit because of that. But I feel like it was uh, ever since then. It's been a like a bug inside of me, and I just, it's just been growing. How much peer pressure was there to play? Soccer slash football. I don't want to offend anybody around the world by, yeah. by picking whichever name you want to call. How much peer pressure was there growing up there that, hey, this is what you play. This is what everybody plays. No, man, I definitely played a lot. Way before, <laughs> way before basketball yeah. was even on the picture, I played soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, a lot. Um, it's, just, it's just natural in, in back home. We play, we play in school, in the school recess two backpacks in the floor and just play like that, you know, like every five minutes, 10 minutes. So it's just, it's just one of those things that is ingrained in us, you know. For people who don't understand the geography, this is what I'm dying to know because as Mark pointed out, you are the first, you were the first to ever ask a question on the show. That's what so I that, do. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Some people get that, to be the that's first. The, that's yeah. the biggest claim to fame important. I can True. make to me. Is. That's something <laughs> that next door is Spain, which has produced a multitude of NBA players, Hall of Fame. NBA players, what is the difference culturally in the two countries where basketball isn't the same as it is in Spain? Um, I honestly think it's a cultural thing. Um, I feel like Portugal is really, really soccer-minded ba- soccer in, in general. But I also feel like Spain is way more, way more diversified in terms of sports. You see them winning in basketball. You see them winning in soccer. You see them winning in tennis you've seen them winning in plenty of other sports so i feel like it's just a cultural thing and at the same time i feel like they invested in basketball way earlier than we did um i feel like basketball has only started to become popular in the last probably 20 years maybe um but maybe but still like they they still had a head start on us so i feel like it's we're we're training our own way and i don't want to make a comparison with with countries and all that but like we're just trying to run our, run our own race you know there are kids watching you right now I mean, social media goes crazy in Portugal when you play. And that, to me, being first is important. But the idea that there are more yous, there are more 10-year-old kids maybe following their sister to practice who all of a sudden now have somebody to look at and say, I can do that. That's pretty cool. No, definitely. I, that's why I try, I try to keep, keep on getting better and just want to make, make them proud. And like, like I said, it's not... It's not a lot of a lot of people that got this type of uncommon story, so I just want to make make everybody believe in themselves and just want to help them achieve their goals with whatever they can. If they can take inspiration in my story, then I'm glad. So born in Lisbon, right? Correct. So I I, I have been blessed to have been able to go over to Portugal for a vacation at one time, and really? I feel like it's this unfound gem. Like not enough people over here know about what it's like over there, how beautiful it is. The coastline is incredible. 
What was it like living there and growing up there? And what, what can you tell people that they might not know about Portugal and why they should maybe go check it out? Uh, yeah, I feel like Portugal is one of those countries that you don't talk about much. Um, I, I really don't know why. It's got great food, it's great weather, um, great views. Like historically, too, it's got really great art, art monuments, all of that. But I feel like it's just it's just such a nice country that I want to go there all the time. I, whenever I got time, I want to always be there, see my family, friends. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Portugal is just such a country that you can always get a good time in a vacation, you know. So you got Lagos. Lagos is a little bit north, right? And then you got the... No, Lagos no, is in the me. south. Lisbon yeah. is Lisbon. north. Yeah. Lagos is a little bit south. How different are those two areas of the country? And how have you gone... I'm, I assume you've gone down to Lagos and had some time uh, No, there. I haven't gone to Lagos, but I know that area down south, like yeah. Algarve. Um, that whole area is really touristic. Yep. Um, it's usually where everybody goes. Tourists go in the summer. It's really got great food, like... It's really, it's really nice in the, in the summer for real. And then Lisbon is always going to be nice during, yeah. the, oh, during the year round. Big much. city vibes yeah. in yeah, Lisbon. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I love my time over there. I love the food. I love just being able to see, like you're yeah. saying, the monuments and everything. Uh -huh. Like th there is a lot of history over there. And I don't know why it's kind of this undiscovered country that not I enough people I talk think it's because you got to walk a lot in Lisbon just because of the hills. <laughs> yeah, that is also that, true. But yes, I also, got my workouts. In. Also, you're you're in there for, for a good time. You got to explore it. Get out yeah. and just do it, you know? Well, that then to me begs the biggest question I have, which is you grow up watching EuroLeague largely, right? You, you're on that track. So not only do you choose to go to college, you go to college – in Utah, which to me, after growing up where we've just discussed you grew up, that's like going to Mars to do something. <laughs> that I'm going to play, instead of being going pro in that natural wave with, with Spain there in the EuroLeague, you're going to play college basketball in the U.S., in Utah. It's almost like you say, let me have the exact opposite experience I could possibly have. Uh, no, not really. It's, if you think about it, it makes sense what you're saying, but also, like, I got to put you in perspective, you know? Like, back in the day, like, uh, uh, I, I could have gone pro and played in Europe, but I, at the same time, I felt like it was a harder harder way to get to, to the NBA, and I felt like it wasn't really going to benefit me as much, you know? Like, I, I felt like I didn't have as much exposure over there. Um, I felt like the college route would be way better for me in terms of exposure for NBA teams, so I just... I just felt like it was it was a, if I had a right situation to go in college where I could play minutes and um, get get a good be in a good team, you know, I felt like I could have uh, I would be way 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 better positioned to come to the NBA. So I felt like it was that, and at the same time, the staff at Utah State really really invested in me, recruited, went and went and checked out my family back in Portugal, and also I had a one 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 guy that went to school with my older sister playing on the team at Utah State too so oh, yes. so I literally had everything to go everything everything was going right the right way to go to Utah State and it ended up working out great so here I am so I'm joking about the beaches but traveling halfway around the world to leave your family at that age that had to be daunting were they behind you were they supportive of this idea where did you ever go back and forth or were you like you know what this is definitely me. this is me no, obviously my family wanted me to stay closer than them, um, but they they kind of understood that uh, there was a there was a good plan in mind. Like we had a good structure, good good a good chemistry do, going going to do that. So I felt like they was always on my side. Um, it was hard and tough because I wasn't able to go go home on big holidays or only one time a year, you know. But it is what it is, and I felt like it. Sometimes you got to make sacrifices for what you want, you know. And newsflash, it worked, right? Most here you are, here you are a few years later. Um, but one thing that most people are not going to know is that this is kind of full circle for you, right? You're here with the Celtics, but when you arrived at Utah State, there was another tie to the Celtics that was there on the team with you, right? Crew Ainge, Correct. Danny yeah. Ainge's son, Correct. was playing for the team. What was that like to randomly kind of interact with him? And we know Crew, he's been around here for years, uh, but just being able to meet him and kind of have that connection to the Celtics from the second you got to Utah State. Yeah, um, it's, it's funny it come, how it comes out first full circle because uh, we, we've always been we've always been connected from the moment I got there. Um, Crew's always been one of my good guys, and he always 
try to help me try to help me with what he knew about this this type of world what, what was kind of needed for me to get there you know so it felt it felt like it was a really good situation for me and look at us now i'm pretty sure he put in word you know yeah and listen i i heard from someone in the grapevine here in this building that when you got there crew sent a text message and said hey a first round pick just arrived like this <laughs> yeah, guy is an I'm nba pretty, player yeah. and this was like right when you walked onto campus how do you think you made that impression that long ago when, I mean, you weren't that long into playing basketball, right? Probably like seven, eight years at yeah. that point. Yeah. I feel like it was just, uh, maybe I think it was the way, the way I came in at practice or blocking shots. And yeah. Through, yeah. Through the I, walls. Felt like, yeah. I felt like, uh, not a lot of people knew of me. I, I did. I wasn't like a five-star recruit, yeah. three-star recruit, whatever it was. Like I came from overseas, like, out of nowhere nobody really was expecting much out of me and all of a sudden i'm i'm out there like as a freshman and really playing really really solid minutes on a team that's playing really nicely so i felt like that all of that helped did you ever see danny at the games ever talk to him no 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 i, I i've never seen him out there but i i, kinda, I met him already all right yeah hey, if you know danny he saw you yeah, <laughs> yeah. i guarantee you I'm that pretty sure Young players don't – shot blockers, they say, are born, not made. Did you feel instinctively you had enough of a feel for the game that you were going to be a shot blocker right away, or was that something in college once you got there, all right, I'm starting to see how the game is played. I'm starting to feel that I can become a shot blocker. Um, I wouldn't say I really was a shot blocker from an early age. I felt like I picked it up as I, as I, as I got more court. with me high wise and I had to be versatile defensively and a little bit offensively so I feel like those are the things I'm I'm really good at but the shot blocking it came it came with time and like getting reps um I feel like once I got to college um the positioning like the film the study the weight room all of that helped me just to get get a lot better at it and I feel like it it's been with me ever since I got to college with that what was the college life like for you, it's, we're at a fascinating time in the league where a lot of guys are choosing other ways to get to the league. And here, as this is what I was getting at earlier, you had almost a natural path to not choose it. And yet, I think there's an experience there. It's not just having practice and having reps, but a college life that I think is important for a young man to have. Yeah, um, there's a lot of aspects I feel like are important like uh, from college that I took. Um, for example, like the discipline of having to do uh schoolwork that makes you be more responsible with stuff off the court as didn't well. Didn't work for you, by the no, way. No, no, no. I don't even know no, how I'm here right uh, now. Yeah, responsible now. <laughs> <huh>? <laughs> no, but I feel like that that definitely helped me. Um the discipline of uh six AM workouts in college, stuff like that it really helps you because it carries over to this day, you know. So I'm really I'm really thankful I chose that route and it kinda helped me see a different side of things for for life and basketball too. Nimi, you said that you started blocking shots when you got bigger. When did that happen? Like, when did the, the big growth spurt happen when you were like, all right, like, I'm different than yeah. these other guys? So uh, I was about 16. Uh, I, had a, I had a family and friends. I went there for two months, came back like three inches taller in like two months. <laughs> what? Yeah. Did your legs hurt? Uh, I really didn't think I got that tall yeah, until until they, I got. They were like, "Who yeah, is this guy?" Yeah, yeah, all my friends was like, "Yo, this is not the same person," <laughs> you know. So, how tall were you after that spurt? Uh, probably one ninety six seven. Okay. What's that? Two hundred two meters. I don't yep, know. Two. Yep. I was about like one ninety. I can't do that. We just talked about my school. I can't do those. Yeah. So. He but could, yeah, no, with six, a calculator, seven, he couldn't. Yeah, do. exactly. Yeah, six seven. You you eventually get to seven foot. No, obviously. no, no. I, I I grew into six six seven six eight. I was okay. like six five. Okay, and the, but then eventually you get to where you are yeah. now. Did that continue to happen yeah, while but you were it was, Utah State? Uh, probably another inch. Yep. Uh huh. And then as during that process, you're learning the defense, you're studying the film and all that stuff. You wind up going on to win Defensive Player of the Year in the conference multiple times. You almost came out to go into the draft uh, and, and stay in the draft after your freshman year. 
So talk to me about that process of learning the game, learning where you stand, thinking about coming out potentially after your freshman year and then deciding to go back and really continue to hone in on, on like what you needed to do to get to where you are now. Yeah, obviously I felt like uh, the way the first year just went, um, uh, everything went perfect mm -hmm. individually as a team too. So I just felt like uh, why not try and see see how, how I stand out. Mm -hmm. um, go through the combine, get a couple of workouts in, um, see what the feedback might be um, from the teams. And I tried my tried, tried to get in there. Um, it didn't work, go as well as I thought it was going to be. But at the same time, I got the experience. I got the, the feedback and I learned I, under, I learned that uh, what they were trying to get out of me. And I felt like it was a good a good uh, lear learning experience for my future just because of the because of the because of the feedback I was going to get as well. What um, was that feedback? Because uh, just I mean, getting sometimes, sometimes getting stronger. people can't take that. Yeah. Yeah, you know? yeah. I always was honest with myself. Like, yeah. I feel like I was a easy to learn with uh, easy for me to learn. Um, I listen, you know, so they told me that I needed to get stronger, um, get it, move better laterally. And I feel like I, that was some of the things I really improved on going to college. Um, the next two years I got way better and defensively I was able to switch in the perimeter move better laterally um, get stronger I put up a couple pounds too ever since then so ever since that's that's one of the reasons why I was able to thrive in the last few years in college and get 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 drafted that. That, that's great because I mean as I was just getting to there like not only not basketball players but just people in the world some people cannot accept the the criticism of where they need to improve right and you were able to listen accept it and then turn it into motivation to get you to where you are today so kudos to you to being able to do that because not a peop not a lot of people can do that there's people in the in the nba who got into the nba purely off of their ability that are no longer in the nba because they weren't able to do that after they got here yeah so that's pretty cool uh, i feel like uh, it's an understanding of uh most of the times it's not even personal they're just trying to help you get better mm -hmm. so you just got to listen to what it is and decide what you want to do with it you know Mark, you know what I thought when I found out Flexcar was going to be our new sponsor? No, what'd you think? I don't know. I don't know what I thought. Neither did I, but then I went and checked it out. And? And it's basically a car subscription, and you choose the mileage package that fits you best, and that's it. Okay, yeah, cool. It, it's, it's honestly pretty cool. And it includes roadside assistance 24-7, car insurance, and maintenance. It's all included. In one bill? All in one bill. The only thing that is not included is the gas you put in the tank. And on top of that, it's cheaper. It's like 10 to 20% cheaper than buying or leasing a car. And what are you doing right now? I'm finding my next car. All right, well, if you're doing that, make sure you use the code RAFTERS mm. and you'll get 100 free miles when you sign up. Millions of kids have this dream to be sitting where you're sitting right now. With us. With us yeah, here, that's what I meant. Days. I didn't mean playing in the NBA. I meant sitting here with us having this conversation. And then there was a moment for the very select few when it becomes real, like this could, this could really happen. I really could be there. Was there a moment for you as before college, going halfway around the world to play in college, where you realized this isn't a crazy childhood pipe dream anymore? This might really happen for me. Yeah. Um, uh, when, the year before, before college, I had a conversation with one of my coaches. Um, he, just, he just pretty much told me, Sat, sat down with me and just told me about the potential like just about the amount of work I was putting in and ever since then uh I just felt like uh I was really it kind of like opened opened my mind the way you put it put in, into perspective um the development of players like Giannis like skinny players that wasn't coordinated and like in three four years just they, they just become so 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 different with the amount of work they put in you know so I felt like that was one of the things that really really flipped the script for me. And ever since then, I just became a different player the, with the amount of uh, hours I was putting in, the amount of work I was putting in, and the difference difference in the uh, importance of everything that comes in between the game. So shout out to C Coach Bruno. How long, when did he start coaching you? Uh, 16 to 18. And he just saw it in you? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's great. No, I mean, if... if Anyone, shout out to him, like you just said, but being able to sit you down and get you to be in that mindset for the rest of your life to be able to work to get to where you are today, that's pretty cool too. Uh, so 
you come out of the draft after three years, or you come out of college after three years, going to the draft, selected in the second round by the Kings, and you're there for a couple of years. What was the experience out there and playing in the G League and going back and forth between Sacramento and Stockton? I feel like it was a valuable experience, um, being able to get introduced to the NBA world, um, see see a little bit of what it is, how it takes, uh, what it takes to be to be successful. Because um, I, I was there when when the Kings was pretty bad the last few when the last year, and then we became pretty good. So I kind of understand both sides of the spectrum with that, uh, how it's to be a good team and how to be a, on, in a bad team. So I feel like it was really valuable for me. And at the same time, the G League run was really good for me because I was able to play more, get get consistent minutes. And play well. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, even more important, most right? Definitely. Also, I felt like I did it. I learned a lot from my mistakes just getting the continuity and the, the, the leeway to understand with that. I feel like it was really important beneficial for the development of what I got today and I feel like I, I develop a lot in terms of free throw percentage just in there do mm -hmm. you see in the G League the desire in some guys to, we just talked about your desire to work and to get better from when you were young to being in college the G League can sort of be a continuation of that that I think some guys take full advantage of and some guys don't it could be a separator facts I, no, I, I like the backup. It, it is true. Like, no, but you could see, right? It's like there are guys that take advantage of it, and there are guys that say, oh, I'm in the G League, I should be in the NBA, whatever. And it is just another, I guess the string I'm trying to draw through this whole thing is you've taken advantage of all these opportunities that have been given to you, and the G League was a perfect one. No, yeah, I feel like the G League is, you can make, you can make the G League your best or worst enemy. That's it. It's up to your mentality and how, how, you, how you take it. Um, I feel like a lot of guys know that they'll be in the G League, but at the same time, they expect to get in there, like get 30 points and just get out quick. Um, most of the time, it's not going to be like that. You got you to gotta grind through it. Um, you don't know how long you're going to be there. You just got to go with the same mindset that you would be going with if, as if you were up top, you know, like you get in there. I know it's tougher, different, but at the same time, you just got to be able to put it as it is what it is. You always got to get better on your own and just – um, be a professional because you never know when the when the when you get may 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 get called up. I mean, there's another couple guys in this locker room who went through the exact yeah. same process, and now they're full time players on this team. Sam Hauser, you know, top eight rotational player on this team right now. He started in the G League as a two way player. You got Luke Cornett, who is now a full time player with the Celtics. So, have you had any conversations with them about what the experience was and how that they kind of parlayed that into being? on a full contract in the NBA. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about it. Um, these guys have been been put in work for so such a long time. Um, to get to the, where they are nowadays is amazing. Um, I'm really happy for them. But And also, uh, it's just, you know how, how the G League gets. Uh, it's hard for you to get down there, and obviously, kudos to them, because they obviously got put in the work to get to where they are right now. Um, so I'm really, I'm really, I'm really happy for them. There are not only coaches who to help you. There are players that you can look at to study and say, man, I, I want to be that kind of player. You did a podcast about a year and a half ago I was listening to the other day. And you're with Sacramento, and they asked you about different guys that you look at. I thought it was pretty ironic because the first name you said was Al Horford. <laughs> and here, yeah. here Talk you about are full getting, circle. getting to see him <laughs> every day. As a player you looked at from afar saying, I want to be able to do what he does and be that kind of versatile player. Yeah, man. Like Alf is such a versatile player with the amount of things that he can do on the court um, and off the court too. Like leading leading the team in the locker room too. Um, I feel like he's he's one of those players that you. It's so hard to keep off the court just because mm -hmm. off of his energy, like the winning plays he makes, um, the communication. Um, not to mention the switching one through five, making shots like rebounding like making the right play most of the times i said it pretty much a lot of things that he can do right you know so it's really it's really helpful to have a guy like that and he's a veteran at the same time that has been through it and it can pretty much guide me through what he's been through you get to see him work and now you yeah. get to see in three dimensions the work that resulted in all that that's yeah. pretty cool yeah yeah i need to translate a little bit of it you are, 
right? Plus like let's point. let's not beat around the bush here, right? Like the Celtics scooped you up right after you got waived by the Kings and you come here on a two-way contract. But it's kind of not been like you're on a two-way for the last couple months, right? Like the team goes out west and you're the man putting up two double doubles in three games out on that West Coast trip, helping the Celtics to a three and three and one trip. So like it is paying off and you are turning it into something. And there's a lot of people out there talking about why is this why is he still on a two-way? He, he should be up on the team full time right now. What's this process been like for you the, the first few months and playing the most in the NBA that you've ever played at this point? Yeah, I feel like it's, it's just coming along naturally. I feel like I've been putting in the work for such a long time that um, with the consistency I've been getting on the court with minutes and all that, I feel like I just I'm just starting to produce now. Um, but at the same time, it's all about helping the team win. Um, I'm not really thinking about putting up numbers, like you said, or just anything like that. It's just I'm getting in there, helping the team, finding, playing my role, getting, making tough guy plays, going for rebounds, stuff like that, you know. What conversations have you had with Joe about that role and with Brad about that role and what you can bring to this team for the final X amount that we've got, got left, another 50 games or so? Yeah, like like they said, it's, you never really know when when it's your opportunity to go go get some minutes. Um, they just want me to stay ready because um, there's not a lot of minutes up for grabs with all these guys that are really good. But at the same time, I'm really I'm really fighting for them. At the same time, I'm really getting ready every day. I'm really trying to trying to help my trying to help myself be 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 productive on the court with the amount of work I'm putting in. So whenever they call my call upon my name, I can help the team contribute. You said your first year in Sacramento, the Kings are still making that transition, still sort of rising, had the really good year last year. And that's, it's a, that's a great place to play. The fans are, are special. It was a special year last year with the Kings. Chris Hopsport's has been in the league a long time, and I haven't seen that dude not smile from the second he got <laughs> here. It's just constant. And even he is overwhelmed by the experience of playing in Boston with this crowd, which is insane. You are from a part of the world that's sports crazy. Can you appreciate being at TD Garden with the fans as insane as they are right now for this team in this moment? No, the fans are lovely over here. Um, I'm, really, I'm really happy that I'm a part of such a uh, appreciative fan base. Um, Everywhere, everywhere I go, I feel like I'm I'm getting recognized a lot. You know, like people show me so much love. So I'm really happy that I'm I'm playing for the Celtics right now with these type of fans. And he's ready for the winter because he was in Utah for yeah. There you go. True. You're in Utah, True. right? Hey, before we let you go, I gotta ask you this: Have you paid attention or have you heard about Joe Mazzulla cracking jokes about your goaltending? <laughs> <laughs> to the media, yeah. that that tells me yes, you have seen. Yes, him. yes. What was your reaction when you saw him cracking those jokes? Hey, man, it is what it is. <laughs> you know, Joe is like that. He also and there's some seriousness into yeah. it, you know. But at the same time, I, half I like, means it, half yeah, joking. Yeah, well, for, like, for, people like, who, for people who don't know, is there's the old saying like you like the goaltending because it sends a message to the team. And Joe's like, no. It gives two points to the other team. I don't need that. I don't need yeah. that message. So. Nah, he's been on me on that, so uh, I need a bit better. All right. So then, last one on that. How how do you develop in that in that sense of like knowing when to go for it and when to not? Obviously, I feel like uh, as a shot blocker, I f I'm trying to go for all of them. Yep. You know, like that's my job. That's what I feel like I'm really good at. So I'm my confidence is always trying to go give get get shots, block shots. But there's always a fine term. I just need a. I just need a figure out a lot of t a lot of them is like a half a second or, or like less. or less yeah. you know they're right there but it is what it is i i'm just i'm just learning i'm trying to figure out the game and once it slows down for me i feel like i'll i'll block more than what i'm doing you know no more goal tents i'll it, i'll get a few still it's, you it's know gonna but, happen. Yeah, every yeah, shot blocker gets yeah, them. There's but no question. it is what it is i feel like i'll get more yeah well that's how you honed your shot blocking skills is it true you honed your skills learning english watching prison break that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a fact. That's a fact. Because kids, so there you go, kids. Tell your parents, I can look at what I can do by yeah, watching TV. Yeah, just watch TV. Yeah. I can I'll figure anything. it all out. You can. Hey, parents, the bad thing you do is putting your kids on timeout not watching TV. <laughs> that's the thing you're doing.
if, that was, if that was a great show. Yeah, if there's nothing else you take away from this, parents, let the kids watch TV, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. No, but th this has been awesome. It's great getting to know you a little bit more in your story. I know the fans are going to love it. And congrats, man. Like, it, it, to Sean's point, like, you've just embraced every moment and every opportunity, and you've turned it into what it is right now. And what it is right now is you're playing the most you ever have in your NBA career. You're contributing to a title contender, and that's pretty friggin' cool to see that come from where you were in Portugal, coming from a country that didn't have an NBA player before you. So congrats on that, man. Most definitely. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it.